Test, test. Okay, please, please, everybody, uh, take a seat. You hear me, please? Back to order. Okay, I have a few announcement before, announcements before we start. Uh, uh, after this uh, Jean, Jean's talk, uh, there'll be a poster session. And beer will come in the room over there. It'll be right there. There are several things that you have to respect here. So if you get a beer here, you have to show your ID, okay? There's no exception. That's a rule here at, at Colorado University. So everybody has to show their ID, even me. Look. So, uh, so everybody's going to be here and showing their ID. And you get a beer. You cannot go outside of these rooms here, OK? You have to stay in these rooms. Please stay in the rooms, because we don't want the, the, the people here, the staff, to get a bad rep with the, the rest of the, the university, OK? So be nice and stay in the rooms. There is enough space here. The posters are here, so stay here, OK? And uh, uh, also, don't worry. There are police outside. But you know, if you don't get out of the room, you're not going to get beat up. Or, so, so stay in the room and, and you know, it's going to be fun, okay? So now we're going to go on with uh, the, the, the workshop and uh, we're going to have a talk by uh, Jean Braun about uh, parameterizing surface processes and their response to tectonic climatic, force, climatic forcing. Thank you, Jean. Thanks, Luke, and thank you for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. So like uh, the previous two speakers, I'm a transfuge from dynamics tectonic modeling into surface processes modeling. And what I'd like to do today is address my colleagues, my former colleagues of the geodynamics tectonics community, modeling community, by um, making the assumption that geomorphologists have done their job and they have produced parameterizations or equations that do actually represent or uh, have a, a predictive power in terms of representing out surface processes. And I'm going to take those explain them very briefly, I don't have much time, and, and most, mostly use them to show the consequences they have for this coupling between tectonics, and erosion, and, and I must say climate, because back in the days, this link that we were trying to show and then we were trying to demonstrate using models between erosion and tectonics really was trying to relate tectonics to climate. And, and, and I think I'll, I'll show that uh, more soon. So let's start by looking at the um, response of surface processes and potentially the feedback to tectonics to tectonics forces. And to do that, I'll simply do what uh, uh, Jean has already started to tell us and, and others that think of, a, of an or, or origin, mountain uh, building as a cycle. It's been in, in the uh, geomorphology literature for many, many years and was maybe more recently uh, by Howard in 84, and from the tectonics point of view, they, they also realized that there may be some uh, link with surface processes and that you can get to this uh, idea of a steady state between uplift tectonics and erosion, which was proposed by Jamieson and Bowman in 98. So the idea, if you take a model or if you think about the real world, that you have a region that in which uplift is caused by many convergence between two plates, and the uplift causes erosion to kick in and erode the surface. And after some time, uh, you reach steady state between erosion and, and uh, uh, tectonic uplift. And we think, for example, that this has happened in New Zealand, in the southern half of New Zealand. I won't say much about it. Uh, Fridra, Fridra has already said a lot about New Zealand. But if you just look at the rate at which it's been converging and for how long it's been converging, the total convergence is of the order of 50, 100 kilometers. And the mountain you know, is tiny. So clearly, you must have reached some kind of steady state. How long did it take to get to this uh, steady state? We can actually say in New Zealand, it didn't take more than a few million years at most, because we know when the conversion started. And we also know roughly when the strong orographic control uh, actually happened. Uh, and, and so we have an idea of when the present day topography was actually created. And it didn't take more than a couple of million years. Now, the end of the cycle is if you stop uplifting, it just dies away. Okay, You remove the topography by uh, and as I will show you in a, in a moment, for, for many origins, actually, it looks like that stage will last much longer than the growth. Uh, as an example, I'll just take the Pyrenees, which you may know, and I'm friends in Spain or Iberia and the rest of Europe. The collision stopped there about 25 million years ago. And if you look at the Pyrenees, 
they are still a pretty substantial topographic feature. And if you compare the Pyrenees to the Southern Alps, you actually ski on both. Okay? So they are very similar in height and shape and, and appearance. So, math. I'm going to do a little bit of math with you. Don't worry. So I'm, I'm going to explain. And, and I just want you to get the essence of it, not the details. So one way we model erosion is by using the stream power law, which we say is incision by rivers into bedrock. And we say that erosion is proportional to drainage area and slope to sample power. In the K here, we've also put precipitation, which you can take out, okay, which is mean precipitation, and which also it must be to the same power as K. So what I've done here is I've actually solved that equation for you uh, and looked at time versus height. And as I told you, as you go and look at the height, it grows until you reach some kind of steady state, then it stops. And then if I remove the uplift, then it decays as well. What I've done here is actually scaled the height by, well, this is mean height, but you could just think of this being the height divided, or the maximum height, scaled by the final height, okay, the one that reaches steady state. For the stream power law, if you use that equation, you can actually figure out, you know, correct the debt, and Helen did that a long time ago, the real, the, what the, actually the theoretical um, value of that maximum height. Okay? And what you can also do is figure out the uh, 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 response time, tau, which is also a function of the you can extract from the equation. And the key thing with what you do when you dimensionalize your, your, your model parameters or your variables here, if you scale h by h0 and t by tau, you can actually vary the value of u, k, m, s, the power exponent, you will always get the same curve. I mentioned like that. Okay? What's interesting is that you can also show that tau here is simply h0 divided by u divided by rho prime. And rho prime is something that measures the efficiency of isosceles. So it, it really is a function of the elastic plate thickness that you assume. If you are you know, on a hard lithosphere, there is no isostasy. And then every time you rode one kilometer, the topography goes down by one kilometer. If you're in local isostasy, every time you rode a kilometer, you remove less topography. Goes down. Okay. So the key about this is that you can actually derive the value of tau, how long it takes to get to steady state, simply from the final topography, the uplift rate, and this uh, isostatic uh, factor. And if you assume that a mountain has reached steady state, then the erosion rate must be equal to the uplift rate. So what I've done here is quite simple, is I've actually used thermochronology, fission track dating, to estimate the present day erosion rate in many mountain belts. And I assume that for most of these, we must be very close to steady state, so that must be equal to u. I can measure the height of the mountain, you know, maps, and then for the rebound, or the uh, isostatic effect, I just look at either global compilation or local studies that give me the elastic plate thickness. And if you do that, then what you can do is regardless of what you assume as an erosional process, if I come back one slide, in this equation now, we don't have to assume anything about the erosional process, okay? What happens is that you can predict, sorry, the uh, orogenic time scale or the response time, the time it takes to actually get to equilibrium for all these mountain belts. It's an approximation, but I believe quite a, a good approach. And you see that the, it ranges from, let's say, one million year, maybe for the, the West Coast of New Zealand, uh, to something of the order of 15 million years. So in the range, one to 10 million years, which is also what seems to be observed by looking at uh, what I said, for example, in New Zealand, but also the sedimentary record, which sees that, that when do you reach this constant sedimentary flux coming out of the lower mountain. And you can see, uh, well, one thing that I've done with that is actually try to answer a question that all of my all my friends and colleagues from the geodynamic community ask me, they say, oh, do you have an erosion model that I can put on top of my tectonic model? So I give them you know, the stream power law or a version of it. And then they ask me, oh, what should I use for K, M, and N? And I go, hmm, okay, it depends, okay? The only thing we know, the thing we know, is that the ratio M over N is about 0 0.4, 0 0.45, okay? But we don't know very much about K. So what I've done here is I look back at the Expression for the time scale that I derived earlier. And you see that if from it, if I then, this is only, it's independent of the process. Okay? But if I assume that the stream power law is the process, you can look simply at the relationship between these two, and the power between the two should give me the value of n. So if n equals one, for example, 
how should not depend on you. Okay, we know that. So I've done that, and you can do a fit, and what you find is that best fit value is Q. So this assumes somehow that you know, there's a global value for N, which we know is kind of not true. I'm not saying that you know, I can tell you that the value of N is true in all the mountains and all the other systems in the world. But what you can do with this is actually provide to the, the, the modelers, the tectonic modelers, with a law, okay, an erosion law with numbers in them that would give them the right mountain height or an average mountain height on Earth. Okay? And what also it does, it provides them with a, with a good time scale for the evolution of the system as a function of the uplift and the isostasy of the rock. You can do a little bit better even by trying to fit both K and N, assuming that there are kind of you know, absolute values for K and N. And in that case, you get slightly lower value of N of only 1.25. So the question you could ask, oh, you should have told the one, because you know, N equals one is much easier as a linear rule. And then you figure out a K that, that kind of fits that. And they shouldn't worry because N, the power there, only really matters about you know, if you are interested in the shape of nick points in rivers, which a tech, you know, guy in tectonics doesn't really care. Well, it's not that simple because what happened, I'll just show you here two model runs, okay, in which I've simply changed n equals one and n equals two, and I have scaled the k so that the, the, the final topography is the same, the steady state is the same. Okay, okay so you run the models, <coughs> they get to steady state, and then after a few million years, boop, you stop the view, and then you go and decrease. What you notice, actually, is that depending on n, the rate at which the topography disappears is much different. And the higher n, the longer your you know, remnant of topography will stay. And you can show, actually, that because you turn u off, okay, u turns off, then you don't have any more a typical exponential increase or decrease. So you get, actually, a power law decrease. And you can show that that power law actually becomes an exponential when n equals 1 but it's strongly dependent on N. And you can think now, if you want to recast that into any kind of you know, erosion model, it doesn't have to be the supreme power law, what really matters is how topography, all the slope, all the curvature, which power it appears in the erosion. And that will really determine this asymmetry between the growth phase and the decay phase. And this may maybe explain, in part, with isostasy, because isostasy tends also to increase the length of both the growth and the decay phase, why we have ancient mountain belt, like the southeastern highlands in Australia, or the Pyrenees, that can survive you know, for tens of millions of years, whereas the evidence is that the growth stage is much shorter in length. Okay, now as I said, the cool thing about linking erosion to tectonics is that in fact it links climate to came up with this thing saying like, you know, a mountain will look completely differently if it's born on the equator or at the pole. Okay? So I want to talk now and go back to this idea of what happened now when we change climate and how does the earth, the surface processes here react and potentially does it change. And you know, there's, there's a lot of debate you know, whether this is actually happening. When you, for example, look at the cooling of the climate in the late Cenozoic, did it really change the erosion at the surface of the Earth? Maybe the type of erosion from fluvially dominated to glacially dominated, but also did it change the efficiency of the erosion? So I'm going to take the opportunity to very briefly introduce our best models for uh, glacial erosion. It's in a way much simpler. First, because it assumes that erosion here, so again, uh, the change of height with time is uplift minus erosion. The erosion for, by glaciers is really proportional to sliding velocity of the ice, the way how the, the ice slides on the land. And unlike the K and the N uh, of the, and the M of the screen power law, KG and L are actually quite well controlled. And I won't go through the detail of how it's done, but several methods, quite different methods, came up with very, very similar numbers for L, roughly two, uh, and KG, you know, I don't remember the number, but for two it's about, you know, Whatever, okay? Uh, it's a value of K, which I obviously can't remember by heart. So what we have to do, the difficult part about the glacial erosion is that you have to model the glaciers. And that requires a mass balance you know, between accumulation and deformation. And accumulation, we kind of have a good idea that it depends on altitude. Basically. And we all use this concept of ELA, the equilibrium line altitude, which is the point where uh, 
accumulation equals uh, melt the mantle of the accumulation. The accumulation is lived. Uh, and the problem is that then we have to predict the flow of the ice. We know kind of rheology the ice quite well. It again depends on another n, on Venn's flow, it's about three. But what we don't really know, especially, are these factors that determine how the ice is sliding. It's basically a question of friction of the ice. That's at least a well constraint for us. So I'm going to take that and I'm going to uh, look at well, what happens now if we assume climate changes and we are going to assume cyclic variation in the system of the climate. And I'm going to model them by mapping that into ELA variation. ELA could varies up, to, up and down in response to climate change. And so what we can do is model solving these equations, the, uh, the shape of a glacier on a, on a mountain on profile, and then we can change the ELA, and it, or you can change the accumulation rate in this case, and you can show how the, the, uh, uh, the, the shape of the glacier changes and the effect it has on the erosion. What's really interesting is in this case, again, we can pull time scales out of the equation I showed you earlier. And there are actually here two time scales. When you change the ELA, when you change the climate first, you change the ice. So there's the response time of the ice to the climate change. And then you change the ice, which ultimately starts to change the erosion, which change the shape of the mountain on which the ice is, and you get to a new steady state. So that is another time scale, what I would call the erosion or glacial erosion time scale. And you can show, because we know KG quite well, that the the response time of the ice is of the order of a few hundred to a few thousand years, whereas the erosional response time is much longer from you know, 10,000 years to 10 million years. And we also know, don't, don't remember that, if you want to remember anything, you remember this, if we focus on the erosional time scale, that it must scale as the accumulation rate to minus two thirds of one over the accumulation rate. And in the case of where L equals two, which is the most likely, it also scales with the inverse of the absolute value. So with Frederick Herman, you know, we've, we've done uh, this work together, and, and Eric, you see Eric Deal as well. We've actually run many models and tried to find out what we call the shape of this gain. I was explaining you very simply what the gain is. We force the system with a periodic signal in ELA altitude uh, at various periods. And for each period, we look how much does the sedimentary flux coming out of the, the mountain changes with time? If you have no gain, it means that I'm changing the climate, the flux doesn't change. If the gain is one, it means that if I change the climate by 10%, the sedimentary flux is gonna change by 10%. The gain is higher. So what you see, then in all cases, we get no gain at short periods, high gain in middle range period, and low gain again at high, long period. And the reason is simple. Here, you are going faster than the response time of the ice. So the ice doesn't have the time to change and cannot transmit the signal to the erosion. At the other end here, if you go very, very, very slowly in changing the climate, the ice has the time to change, the glacier has the time to change the way it erodes, and it remains always a steady state with the uplift. And again, you don't see anything happening to the, uh, to the flux, the erosional flux. And you can show, according to, you know, it follows the rules that I've given you from the various time scale that different uplift rates will have different gain function and assuming different mean accumulation rate will have different gain function. So in other words, if you force the signal, let's say Milankovic cycle, okay, we produce Milankovic cycle, different mountains, depending on how fast they're uplifting and what is the mean accumulation rate, will have totally different or very different response to the same forcing in time. And you can go in even deeper and see uh, if we now feed our model with the known uh, cyclicity in climate, which we derive here from the famous you know, Nemo cooling curve of the late Cenozoic, and we can transform that into uh, variation in ELA and put that in our model. And what we see, so what, what is shown here are hours. Okay, so this is hour versus uh, period. And you can see this is the forcing, so this is actually a spectral spectrum of this, the forcing, and you can see the 40,000, 100,000 year cycles, but you can also see in the blue here, this is the long-term cooling of the Cenozoic flux. And then we apply that and we look at the gain okay, that it produces, or the power in terms of sediment flux coming out of the mountain, 
And you can see that depending on the uplift rate or the accumulation rate, you can amplify some periods of some period will disappear. So, for example, in low accumulating area, so where the ice uh, rain or precipitation are low, you really get a big response to the long term cooling. Whereas if you are in a very high uplift area, you really amplify the 100,000 year cycle. <clears throat> so it's really important to do that. And then what you can do, you can do a bit more math if you want, and take other processes, like back to the stream power load, visual decision. You can look at the hill slope diffusion or propagation of a weathering front, and you can derive the value, as I've done before, with the stream power load of the time scales that are of interest. And you can also, in those cases, didn't do it for the glacial erosion. Get analytical functions for these gain functions. And the key, though, is that they vary on, they depend on many things. The mean precipitation, the mean accumulation. They also depend in some cases on the length of the system. All that to say that if I look at, uh, I mean, this is one of these gain functions that I'm plotting, we have little hope, in my opinion, to actually see a global signal of the effect of climate change on erosion. Because Basically, if you sit in the middle of the ocean and look at the sedimentary core and see, oh, do I see actually the Milankovitch cycle with its flux of sediment to the ocean through some proxy? You're unlikely to see it because every part of the system is going to respond differently to the same forces. And I haven't said that, but there's also there's a gain function, there's also a phase function. And not only some of them will amplify or not amplify the signal, some of them will actually offset. Big question we discussed today is also look, we try to couple surface processes with tectonics. There's a big difference in scale. Okay? I want to get down to it where there's a huge difference in time scale. Because <clears throat> as we kind of know in geomorphology, surf the surface processes rated with your efficiency not only depend on the mean precipitation or mean uh, you know, snow accumulation, but also on its variability on the weather. So, you know, ideally, you would want to run your models in a time step like of a day. Rainfall changes from day to day. Of course, especially if you want to couple them to 3D geodynamic models, it's not going to be really helpful to do that. Um, and, and what we do, obviously, is we, we do statistics. I want to show you that. And before I do that, I want to show you that what I said earlier, that, you know, climate really matters. We've actually had difficulties, not the modelers, do that easily, but the guys who do the observation to actually show us <clears throat> that when you change the climate, the erosion gets better. When it rains more, does it erode better? That's data, and this is now precipitation, denudation rate, and you know, let's judge of that. Now, that's a bit biased because obviously I said it's not only precipitation, uplift rate matters, slope matters, and this says, oh, no, it doesn't matter. Okay? But what I want to explore with you is also how does variability in climate matter? Why would it be important? But it is important in erosional processes because there are thresholds. So if you have this boulder in the middle of a river, this is a slide from Eric, who you recognize, you, you can realize that it's not going to move until, until the discharge in the river reaches some critical value, and then it will move. So clearly, many processes in the surface of the earth are characterized by thresholds. And therefore, the variability of the flow becomes really important because what will really matter are the large events that will go above the threshold and move materials from rivers or in glaciers or from here. So we have to have a, a statistical approach to do that, as I said, and the typical thing that we do, and Greg here has been one of the people doing this first to try to characterize the discharge in rivers is a statistical, with, with the statistical properties, is to look at distribution of discharge at a given point, River. And so, you know, these distribution that give us the frequency of a given discharge in a river compared to other discharges. And you see what I'm showing you again, this is an animation from Eric, a cool animation that shows uh, different sets of dis discharge uh, probability density function that are all characterized by the same mean, but obviously have different variability. Okay? The white one is much more variable with more events of very large size and small size. The narrow one have much less probability of a high impact event. And you see now, if I have a threshold here and discharge to move that rock, you can see that high variability implies high erosion rate, low variability implies low erosion rate. So I've summarized this here. Erosion efficiency slightly must be a function of the 
threshold, but it should also be a question, uh, a function of the shape of that. Okay, so the variability, and you can show also on the slope of what's called the tail of the function. That's really important. So more math, and I'll keep this about 10 seconds on the, on the uh, Eric for his PhD, he's actually shown that you can do that, like others have done it before him, but he's also shown that you can do it using a, a family, if you want, of distribution uh, functions for discharge in rivers that fits much better observed distribution in nature. And it involves a couple of parameters that you can actually extract from looking at recession curves in rivers. You sit in a river and you look at what the discharge is doing after a big flooding big storm. The key to this is that you end up with variability and another parameter B, and you can show that these depend mostly on the response time scale of a catchment, which must be related to evapotranspiration or maybe even vegetation and properties of the soil properties of the catchment, the frequency of storm, and um, the strength of the storm. So the, the cool thing about this too is that you can relate not only you can get the discharge, but you can relate it to climatic parameters. So you can go from precipitation to discharge. And after having done that, you can fall back onto a pure stream power law, okay? A stream uh, power that means that erosion rate is proportional to slope area, and you've started to untangle what you put in the K. What you put in the K depends only on moments of that distribution. And, and in the case of these, well, especially the value of these, we have an analytical solution for that. So you can actually almost do a simple stream power law, uh, make build with build into it the link between variability of climate and, and the erosion. That's for, for the time is running. Um, does it matter? Okay, does it matter really? I told you, well, you need a threshold and you need a very uncertain type of distribution. This is something we just submitted with Eric, and you know, feedback is really welcome on this. Great idea that Eric had. But what we do here is actually um, run millions of models, okay, assuming all sorts of thresholds, all sorts of mean value for the, the discharge, all sorts of value for the variability in discharge, so this parameter u, the variability, and also the, the, the parameter b. And what is plotted here is for each of these models is here is the relative magnitude of the threshold compared to the mean discharge. Okay, so if the mean is, if the threshold is at the discharge is one, like here, and if the threshold is higher, you go in that way, if the threshold is lower than the mean discharge. And what you see is that the, the conclusion to this is that variability only matters if the threshold is equal or larger than the mean discharge. And you can actually, this plot, I don't want to go into detail, this is true regardless of what you assume for an equation for erosion. You can assume that the relationship between discharge and erosion rate, specific discharge, is super linear, sublinear, or even inverted. You can have a, this is the full and power effect. <laughs> it always predicts the variability here doesn't matter, whereas it does matter a lot. It produces very large variation in erosion rate for the same mean discharge. Okay? It doesn't matter here if the threshold is below the mean, or it does matter if the threshold is above. And there is lots of consequences for the important, you know, of the erosional system response to the change of climate. And I won't go through all of them, simply to say that you, you can show with this that low threshold systems will be really responding to mean precipitation or rainfall, whereas high threshold system will be proportional to the mean and the variability. And you can show also that the variability is most likely to be related to temperature. Finally, because as you increase the slope of rivers, the threshold decreases. It's easier for a given discharge if there's always a lot of slope. You can show that steep landscape are less sensitive. Mountain ranges, steep mountain ranges are less sensitive variability in discharge and in rainfall than, than shallow flatter areas. So now I'll finish by uh, something that maybe even more exciting than linking climate tectonics, but no you know, far fetched. But I think a lot of us are moving in that area to actually now look at the link between the evolution of life, you know, the formation, the evolution of biodiversity, for example, in a given place on Earth, and the evolution of the landscape. And I'd like to go one step beyond, you know, and, and actually link it to what happens deep in the ocean. Totally, probably. 
series. But so uh, we're doing this with uh, two postdoc, uh, Katrin Kravich, who's actually here in Boulder, and um, Yao Ruong. Uh, and we are looking spe specifically at Madagascar, which you may know, uh, have learned this already, is actually characterized by a very uh, peculiar biota, and especially this concept of microendemism. What it means, if you look, for example, here at uh, the deer, the monkeys, uh, that you see that in all of these catchments, what you have is one species of lemur occupies everywhere the same ecological niche. So you think, you know, they would have for a long time ago decided that one better than the others and would take over the, the whole island. No, they not only didn't spread over the whole island, but they live, each of them specifically, one catchment. But there are exceptions to that, and that's the inland catchment, where you don't have this micro -endemism. so they all live together. Um, but two things are interesting, because what I just described. The other thing is also the distribution of catchment in Madagascar. It's quite unusual, actually, for a mountainous area, which has a lot of topography in Madagascar, to have this high purge catchment okay, that are connected to the, to the base level by these narrow uh, valleys, okay? whereas you have these, these other catchment that are more natural, although they are very elongated. Now, there's all sorts of reasons that people, ecologists, have used to explain the microendemism. But one thing, and I'm going to go into detail of that, they're related to the shape of the, of the, of the catchment. But also, um, one thing to keep in, in mind is that if you try to time when this microendemism actually happens, so when species uh, speciation happens, potentially related to the catchment split, for example, you actually realize this is late, late Cretaceous, so talking about 60 million years ago present. So this is a very long process. It didn't happen overnight. And it's mostly related first from the fact that Madagascar drifted away from Africa. And the arrows I've put there, which seem to correspond to these branching events happen, are actually relatively well-documented um, relief event in Madagascar. So uplift, but also drainage reorganization event. And that's the work of a PhD student in, in N, uh, Antoine Gauthier. So let me now get to my um, crazy explanation of, of this. And it, it relates to flexure, okay? So to the strength of the underlying lift system. Why? Well, an island is creating by rifting or by uplift of an area that's surrounded by water, okay? So when you create the relief, let's say by rifting, you create escarpments on either side of the island. And these escarpments are going to erode away. And that's going to create unloading at the surface and by, by exhaustion, the figure is going to go up. Now, flexure will distribute that rebound. And if you have uh, local isostasy, the, the thing will remain basically like this. Sorry, uh, if you have uh, uh, no isostasy, a uh, very strong lithosphere, it will remain like this. Whereas if you have a very weak lithosphere, you'll create this, this you know, um, very peaky uh, escarpment top in the middle of a source pan, okay, towards which all the drainage will take place. So what I've done here to express that in, in more in clearer fashion, they run four models of you know a rectangular Madagascar island. The scale is roughly right, and um, I've just changed the elastic plate thickness. And I'll just let you appreciate. So this is a view from the top. I'm showing you the catchment. They evolved through time, and you'll see roughly where the rivers rivers are because I've really increased the uh, topographic exaggeration to make it look good. And what you see is that you know, completely different behaviors in terms of catchment and catchment capture. In the case of a very high elastic plate thickness, you basically produce something that's more typical of an island with very linear catchment that go all the way all to the, to the main divide. If you have a very weak uh, elastic plate thickness, the rebound you get on the pistomary make the system such that there's actually only one catchment. And this is, you know, you say, oh, we never see this on Earth, or we do see that quite often, actually. For example, the Orange River in, in South Africa, which drains the whole of the South African uh, Cretan, is surrounded by these very, you know, uh, elevated uh, regions that are most likely created by a, a flexure associated with the erosion of the plain. In the middle here, we have these bizarre catchments that really look like Madagascar, Madagascar for reference, and also, as you may have seen during the evolution, they are extremely dynamic, much more dynamic, there's much more capture uh, in this situation compared to what happened in either of the other. 
So here we go. It's the thickness of the elastic lithosphere that determines micro endemism in Madagascar. I won't go through because uh, I'm, I'm already over time. And thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you, Jean. Uh, any questions? So, um, great talk, Jean. You reviewed how different um, transfer processes have different eigenfrequencies. And so they have different eigenfrequencies, right? There's a resonance, you have an eigenfrequency, depends on some parameters in some complicated way, but in the end, there's a frequency. Now, you know, if you have something like that, right, physicists thinks, of course, well, we just can look at absorption bands, and then we know what process is happening. You made the case that that's not possible. So I wonder if you could elaborate a little bit on that, because why not look at, you know, forcing we understand, like you did in your synthetic models, and then look at the sediment record, and then divvy out what is the dominant process. So I guess you indicated that these eigenfrequencies are too close together, they overlap, there's a wide spectrum. Why, why is that not possible? You know, the point that I said is that it's not possible if you look at the globally integrated signal. But if you go at the bottom of any mountain belt and look at the sedimentary flux coming out of it in response to the climate event, uh, then yes. Yes, you, you will be able, I mean, that was the purpose of maybe like that. And you know, I published a paper in 2014 where we looked at two uh, geochemical uh, proxies for climate change and erosion. We tried to make the point that you could constrain the stream power law by using that, that proxy. Very nice talk, thank you. So um, I actually have two questions. But, uh, first one is kind of more technology. So you mentioned you use a game function. So what type of game function you are using? Uh, do you think different type of game function will influence your conclusions kind of things? And the second question is, uh, you talk about the variability and the mean. Um, uh, do you think, uh, do you consider like uh, extreme events? like a landslide and debris flow will influence your conclusion about the weathering condition? Okay, so the first one, um, you know, the, the, the gain function that we derive, that, that we use, are derived from the processes. So like, if we go back to the, the slide, the, these gain functions okay, are simply derived from the differential equation we have assumed for the process. So that's classical you know, linear stability analysis. And some kids don't even have to do that. It's just about smoothing the line. And the second question is on variability. Uh, yeah, uh, Eric, um, you could respond, but I can if you want. OK, so, uh, so the, 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 the key, yes, you, you, you write a thing. The conclusion we come to should be, and we haven't really done it for each process, but should be applicable to any process in which, think of it, in which there is a threshold and the forcing, forcing mechanism, whether it's rainfall, whether it's you know, snowfall or, or, or other things, uh, is, has, has a strong variability. But it will only matter, as I said earlier, if the mean of your forcing is close to the threshold. So you can think, yeah, of landsliding or uh, any, any process that has a threshold. Yeah, uh, Jean, Kellen Wubel here. Um, yeah, thanks for a dynamic and fun talk. I want to, there's an opportunity maybe to connect to the, um, the way that coupling might happen. One of the things you explored with like the gain functions was looking at the ELA varying and could you get an increased sediment flux out? So now it seems to me you can't sustain that over long term unless for some reason there's a tectonic response and you increase the uplift. In other words, the, the increase in sediment flux would just be while the morphology adjusts from a fluvial one to a glacial one, and it's going to be over. So maybe there's an opportunity for testing if there is a dynamic response by looking to see if that is sustained over long term. Yeah. So so thing, I, I gotta, but I fully agree with you that any response to uh, stepwise climate change. Is going to last only a period of time until it turns us back to equilibrium. 
um, that time scale, if you can measure it, I think it would be telling us a lot about the process and the way we should run the right now. I think for personally, uh, I think we had a discussion with Marty earlier, it doesn't really, really matter how you put things in equation. What really matters is that time scale. And from a tectonic point of view, okay, if you want to really model the shape of the landscape, of course. But if you're really interested only, as you said, that there are going to be a tectonic feedback, tectonic is going to change to that, that's really all we need. Because, you know, given climate change is going to change the topography by that much. And over that time scale, you, know, you could even dream of highly simplified erosional models. I believe you do quite a good job if you want to connect them to a 3D convection model of the Earth. I have a comment to make, as, as you may know, I, I have three positions to reopen now, two senior scientists position, and I think I invite lots of other positions. People are interested in doing modeling on the surface of the moon, uh, linked with tectonics, climate, life. Contact me. Okay, we need to thank Jean again, because it was great. Okay, thank you so much. <laughs>